Hi everyone and welcome to the chapter 5 lecture which is all about virus structure and viral life cycles. This can be kind of a hefty chapter for people. It's very dense in molecular biology but super interesting especially during a worldwide pandemic of a virus. So let's get into it. So first of all I just want to highlight how abundant viruses are and how important they are in the evolution of life. So viruses can infect every type of cell on the planet, basically. So we think of them mostly as infecting our own cells as humans, but they can infect animals, insects, algae, plants, um, and even all the way down to bacteria. And there are even some viruses that can affect other viruses, which is kind of crazy. Um, but those viruses still need to be in a cell. So it's like a, it's like a, a nesting doll, one, one of those like Russian nesting dolls when you have a virus inside a virus inside a cell, inside a cell. <laughs> um, but yeah, so viruses can infect everything. There are people who are dedicated, there are researchers who are dedicated to studying viruses just in the ocean because there's almost an infinite number of viruses that they just basically go out and sample um, ocean water and every time they do they discover new viruses because there's so many different organisms that live in the ocean and then there's so many different viruses that can infect them. So viruses have been infecting cells since the evolution of cells basically since cells began on this planet and have significantly influenced the evolution of different cells and different organisms because of that. In fact, if you look at the human genome, approximately 10% of the human genome is derived from viruses that we were infected with, you know, long, long ago in evolution before we were even humans. And then those virus viral genes incorporated into our human genome, into our, our cellular genome and and have stayed there. So about 10% of our genome is actually derived, taken at some point from a virus that infected us throughout evolution. Um, bacteria, same thing, 10 to 20% of bacterial DNA came from viruses. So it's kind of crazy to think that viruses aren't just there, they don't just make us sick, but they've actually played a major role in our evolution. And I'll talk about a specific a specific viral protein in the specific um, evolutionary adaptation in later in the lecture. So how were, let's go back in history, how were viruses discovered? We talked a little bit about the history of microbiology and that bacteria weren't really identified until the microscope was invented, until we could visualize them. Well, viruses are too small to visualize through you know, regular light microscopy. So it was much, much later that viruses were discovered. So bacteria were discovered, and in the late 1800s, we started to attribute diseases to bacteria, to these infectious microscopic organisms, and we were able to, to um, you know, prove that. Louis Pasteur was able to, uh, and Robert Koch came up with this sort of scientific method for um, establishing cause and effect of a microorganism and disease. And so they started, scientists and doctors started to recognize the infectious nature of some diseases and that these infectious diseases usually were caused by bacteria that they could identify, but sometimes they couldn't. And so they sort of hypothesized that maybe there was um, a, an infectious material that was even smaller than a bacteria. And they were able to show this. They were able to take a disease that was seemed to follow an infectious pattern, and um, but there was no bacteria associated with it. And they took um, some fluid from like an infected animal, and um, and they filtered it through a filter that would trap the bacteria and things that were as large as bacteria, but things smaller than bacteria would go through this filter, these tiny little filter holes. And then they, sh they showed that this filtrate still was able to cause disease. And so it, it was a confirmation that there is some type of infectious particle that is smaller than bacteria. And 
Um, this was in the 1890s, this research. And so that was our sort of first clue that something like, so they called it a virus, um, this infectious particle. And there's still debate today about whether viruses, when we, when we say that we study microorganisms, microbes, um, viruses are always lumped in, but they're technically not organisms because they cannot um, reproduce outside of a cell. They are obligate intracellular parasites. That means they must live inside a cell and feed off that cell. They basically have, have these genomes that are pared down to just a handful of genes, and so they don't have the genes to make proteins to replicate on their own, but they hijack cellular machinery to do that. So because viruses aren't truly living things, it's um, more correct to describe viruses as either active or inactive rather than live or dead. We, you still will hear the term live virus or dead or inactive. Um, dead, dead virus when um, reading things that are sort of in layman's terms, but technically in like scientific publications, it's not correct to say live virus. Um, you would say active virus or inactive virus because they technically are not live. Um, there's a lot of questions, interesting research questions in the field of virology. There are researchers who are just determined to figure out what role viruses played in the evolution of life. That 10% of our genome that comes from viruses, how did we acquire that? For what purpose? Um, there are others who are more interested in the disease and the pathogen pathogenicity of viruses. How is it? And I think this is what won me over to microbiology in childhood. I just was baffled by how these tiny little particles that aren't even alive can wipe out populations of advanced organisms like ourselves. So um, it's, it's pretty interesting that they are such simple things, yet they've evolved such complex ways to avoid our immune systems and cause disease and bring about our destruction. And then there's a whole slew of viruses that we'll talk about that can cause cancer. And so there are researchers who are specifically focused on viruses and cancer. This is just a table from your textbook that I really like. It's very complete in the properties of viruses. So it's just sort of like a good cheat sheet for different properties of viruses that we'll go through throughout the lecture, but some like sort of key things to remember about viruses are all listed here on this one table. So viruses do get classified into different groups, just like we classify animals in taxonomically and we classify bacteria taxonomically into different species. We don't have different species of viruses per se, we say we have different families. And there's different ways to classify them. You can classify viruses based on what type of host they infect. So plant viruses versus animal viruses um, versus bacterial viruses. You can also classify viruses based on the diseases they cause. We will kind of, be, this, this textbook sort of does that. Um, as we get later into the course, we start talking about pathogens based on what types of diseases, what body systems they infect. Um, we can also classify viruses based on their structure, their physical structure. What their, um, are they enveloped? Are they non-enveloped? What kind of genome do they have, RNA or DNA? And what is their chemical composition? So this is, a, is a, um, an image, a, an example of a classification system of viruses. And just to point out a couple to you, so they're grouped first, the, um, Left side here are all RNA viruses, and the right side here are all DNA viruses. So they're first sorted based on their genetic makeup, then based on the shape of their capsid, the protein shell around them, then whether or not they have an envelope. Non-enveloped viruses are called naked viruses. So just a couple to point out here for you that might be of interest. Here, right here, is the coronavirus family. So SARS-CoV-2 that's causing the current pandemic is an, an enveloped RNA virus, 
um, sometimes compared to flu erroneously, but just to point out where flu is, flu is an orthomyxovirus. So it is also an enveloped RNA virus. They do have that in common. Um, they have different types of RNA genomes though. Um, coronavirus has a positive sense RNA, single-stranded, and flu has a negative sense RNA, single-stranded. The coronavirus has one continuous piece of DNA, or sorry, of RNA, whereas the flu virus ha has eight different segments. So it has eight pieces of RNA genome. So their genomes are actually very different. The viruses, the two viruses are actually quite different. Um, another one that I wanted to point out is this adenovirus over here, because one of the new vaccines that's almost approved, the AstraZeneca vaccine, uses this adenovirus shell. They basically um, put the code for the coronavirus spike protein inside an adenovirus that's harmless but easily infects humans, and they use that as a delivery system for cells. So there's or for, uh, for DNA, for this vaccine, basically. Um, and adenovirus has been used as a delivery package for certain genetic therapies as well. It's a, a, a harmless virus, if you will, that can be used to deliver genetic material to cells. And it, it's a DNA virus, so it contains DNA, um, and so it contains the DNA version of the spike protein instructions. So it's just a handful to point out there that are, are relevant right now. So viruses, just recall from the first lecture, we did that sort of zoom in, um, that viruses are incredibly small. So for reference, if this is a yeast cell, which is still much, is smaller than a very small human cell is a red blood cell, and yeast cells are even smaller than red blood cells. Okay, so their yeast cells, while they look huge in this picture, are still very small. We can, however, see them under a light microscope. We can also see E. coli and Streptococcus under a light microscope. They're very small. Um, and the largest viruses out there are, are still significantly smaller than a Streptococcus. We still can't quite see them in a light microscope, maybe a really good one. You might see tiny things, but um, most viruses that are relevant to human health, as there's some shown here, okay, are very tiny. We cannot see them with a light microscope. We can, however, image them with something called an electron microscope, which has a much higher magnification and resolution. I think this might be a pox virus, but don't quote me on that. Um, so we can we can get images of these viruses, just not in a typical everyday fifty dollar home microscope, but in half million dollar room size microscopes, research facilities. So viruses again, super simple structures, even way way simpler than prokaryotic cells. Very few parts to a virus. So the parts that all viruses have. They must have genetic material. They have nucleic acids. So cells' genetic material, um, their genomes are made up of DNA always. Um, for viruses, though, some viruses have a DNA genome. Some viruses have an RNA genome as their only nucleic acid. So viruses are unique in that way. They cannot have both. They never have both. Um, cells have both. Cells have a DNA genome and then they use RNA to make sort of temporary copies of their DNA. Um, new, so viruses are unique in that they have either RNA or DNA. They do not have both. Then surrounding that genome, that genetic material, is a protein shell called the capsid. So the capsid is usually made, it's made up of basically one protein that repeats itself and just like establishes this structure. It could be a cosahedral in shape. It has different shapes that it could form, but the individual proteins are called capsomeres or capsomers. 
and um, the virus genetic material encodes that capsomer. The cells make a bunch of it, and then they automatically assemble into this shell structure. So they're kind of cool. They're these repeating um, units or spheres almost made out of these identical proteins. When the capsid surrounds the nucleic acid material, when you have that package, that sometimes is referred to as the nucleocapsid. And some viruses just contain a nucleocapsid with various spike proteins attached to it. And the spikes are important because they act as receptors or they bind to receptors on the cells they're going to infect. That is what how the um, virus basically matches to the cell it wants to infect is through its spike proteins. Now, some viruses, so all viruses have these first three parts, spike, capsid, and nucleic acid. Some viruses have another layer outside the capsid called the envelope. And the envelope is just a phospholipid membrane that is actually taken from the host cell when it leaves the host cell, and we'll see how that happens. So the, a virus can be either enveloped, or we can say it's naked if it doesn't have an envelope. That's just, that's actually the scientific term for them. They're naked. That's actually not me being funny and cutesy and anthropomorphizing. It's a technical term. Um, some viruses also contain their own enzymes. So the genetic material of a virus can encode enzymes, that's one thing, but there are some viruses that actually have enzymes packaged in the capsid, that they actually bring enzymes with them um, that they need in order to reproduce. This is a much less common feature of viruses, but still it happens. And a classic one are retroviruses, which come with their own enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So another term for an infectious viral particle is called a virion. So a virion is just another word for an active virus. So let's look, take a closer look at these different capsids. So capsids can have different shapes. Again, they are composed of a single protein called a capsomer. And so you can see in these pictures here how it's, it's just the same protein over and over and over again that makes this three-dimensional structure, whether it's a helical structure or an icosahedral structure. This complex structure here looks like some kind of like sci-fi fictionalized virus, like robot virus, but no, this is literally what bacteriophages look like. These are viruses that actually infect bacterial cells. And in some ways, their structure is much more complex than those of animal viruses that are helical or icosahedral in shape. Um, they look like they look like little robot spiders, but that's literally what they look like in an electron microscope. All right, so the capsid versus the envelope. Remember, they're different things. So the capsid is made up of proteins, repeating units of the same protein. Um, envelopes, though, are take their uh, phospholipid membrane that cover the capsid and they're taken from the cell, the infected cell. So when a virus infects a cell and it makes more genetic material and then it covers it or encapsulates it in the capsid, then when, the, when that nucleocapsid is leaving the cell, it goes to the cell membrane, which has been peppered with viral spike proteins and it basically gets pinched out of the membrane um, and as it leaves it takes a bit of membrane with it and that becomes the viral envelope so this process of pinching off of a cell is called budding viral budding and so enveloped viruses by definition exit the cell through this process of budding and that's how they get their envelope we'll see in a minute that naked viruses do not bud from cells. They just rupture the cell and burst out of the cell, so they don't take membrane with it. A little bit more detail about viral genomes, the viral nucleic acids. Um, they can be either DNA or RNA, we said. So there's lots of different forms of um, viral genomes, and one of the classification systems, actually probably the most used 
classification system of viruses is called the Baltimore classification system, not named after Baltimore, Maryland, named after David Baltimore, who is a famous virologist who coined this system. So viruses can have double-stranded DNA, they can have single-stranded DNA, they could have double-stranded RNA, they could have single-stranded RNA, and RNA can be what we say either positive sense or negative sense. They could have either form. Um, so there's lots of different uh, types of genomes that bacteria, or the, sorry, that viruses can have. Ultimately, within the infected cell, they need to be able to convert their genome into messenger RNA because that's what cells read and turn into um, into proteins. Um, messenger RNA, by the way, is positive sense RNA. So um, there's lots of different mechanisms by which these viruses convert their genetic material into um, readable mRNA for a cell, but we won't get into that, at least not yet. Maybe we'll get into it a little in chapter eight when we talk more about central dogma and how DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. But just showing you that there is a big variety in the types of genomes that viruses have. Um, while there's a lot of variety, there's not a lot of complexity. So viruses contain really anywhere from as little as four genes to maybe hundreds of genes in a large virus. All right, just to compare, just for a little reference, E. coli, which is a pretty simple bacteria, has over 4,000 genes, and humans have somewhere between 20,000 and 50,000 genes. So, and a virus has four. Um, they're pretty small. This is just um, a sample, a table from the book, showing you some of these different types of viral genomes and some um, that you might be familiar with. So pox viruses are double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, herpes simplex is also a double-stranded DNA virus. Polio virus is a single-stranded RNA, so is flu, so is HIV. Okay, so there's different, these are just some examples of these different types of genomes. Um, also, something to point out with viruses, remember with bacteria, bacteria have DNA genomes that are circular and eukaryotes have DNA genomes that are linear, right? But viruses can be either or. Some viruses have a linear, some have circular um, DNA. And when it comes to RNA, RNA is, is never circular. It's always linear, um, but sometimes it's in one piece and sometimes it's in multiple pieces. It's segmented. So flu has eight segments of RNA whereas coronavirus has one. Um, so other miscellaneous components, we said that they can also sometimes have enzymes. So viruses really have, they have so few genes because what they really do, and I made this little picture here, um, is they hijack cells. They basically like a car hijacking or something. They say like, you know, this cell is mine now, I'm taking it over. Um, and and that's what they do. So they really don't need a lot of their own enzymes because once they infect a cell, they have use of all of the cell's enzymes. So no need to carry around a bunch of enzymes that it will have at its destination. Kind of like, you know, like when I travel and I know I'm staying at a hotel, I don't bring toiletries because I just know that the, the hotel's going to provide toiletries for me, so why use up space in my luggage for toiletries that are gonna be there when I get there? Um, so same thing, viruses don't need these enzymes if they, the enzymes they need are gonna be there in the cell. But some enzymes that are not found in cells that viruses will bring with them are specialized polymerases. So human cells are, I'll just go with actually human cells and bacterial cells both. Um, they have um, polymerase. They make they can make DNA from DNA, and in order to replicate their DNA, and they can make RNA from DNA. Um, but sometimes viruses need specialized polymerases to transcribe their own 
own um, genomes, especially if they have like a single stranded DNA genome. Single stranded DNA, not really common in not really found in other types of cells. So they need a special polymerase for that. Um, they also may have uh, special replicases to make copies of their own genomes. And then a particularly unique enzyme is reverse transcriptase, which can sort of go backwards in the normal um, order of things and can make DNA from RNA. And we'll see in chapter eight that that's very unusual. Most cells can only go um, make RNA from DNA and not the other way around. So anything they need for metabolism, though, they don't have to code for. They get all of that, like ATP production and stuff, from the cells that they are hijacking. So when a virus infects a cell, it follows a specific set of steps, and these are the phases of an animal virus replication cycle. We'll talk about bacterial viruses um, at a later point in the lecture. So, and they follow similar stages, but you'll see where they differ. So the first stage is adsorption. This is actually touching, sticking to the surface of the cell you want to infect. Then the virus needs to get into the cell. We say it needs to penetrate the cell. Once it is in the cell, the nucleocapsid needs to open up and release the genetic material that's called uncoding that's step three and then after uncoding now that genetic material is available to the cells machinery to start reading and making copies of it and making capsomer proteins all right and making spike proteins and so then all of those the capsomer proteins basically have like an automatic assembly process around the genome and then it exits the cell, and that's called release. So the synthesis and assembly process, after that happens, um, the virus has to exit the cell. So we'll talk about each of these steps in more detail. First, let's talk about adsorption. So adsorption, cover that, remember that word? Adsorption is that first step of the virus binding to the cell surface. And this usually happens through, a, um, through chemistry, between the viral spike protein and some surface protein on the cell. And so we say that viruses have certain tropisms, um, meaning they have certain types of cells that they will bind to because only certain types of cells express the receptor that matches their spike protein. Um, so some viruses have very specific tissues that they can infect because the receptor that they bind to is only found on very specific cell types. Whereas some viruses can infect a lot of different cell types because they um, bind to a receptor that's very commonly, commonly expressed on lots of different types of cells. And so we call that tissue specificity. Um, we call it a tropism. So you can have some bacteria that are very, they're specific to very specific cells. They have cellular tropism. They may be specific to certain types of tissue, so they can affect lots of different cells in that type of tissue. Or they may even have a host tropism, where they're very specific to a specific species. Um, so viruses that have a um, host tropism, uh, especially human viruses that are specific to humans, are ones that are, are key targets for eradication. And the first virus that we ever eradicated was smallpox virus. Smallpox virus does not exist anymore outside of a few tubes in a few research labs where it's in a freezer, so it can be studied. Okay, but there are have not there's not been a single human case of smallpox since 1976, and we stopped vaccinating people for smallpox. I don't know when, but shortly after that, um, because there's no more human to human transmission of it because smallpox is a spe it's specific to humans. So once we were able to vaccinate humans and stop spreading it between humans, the virus couldn't exist outside of humans, and so we eradicated it, it's completely gone from the planet. We're super, super close to doing this with polio virus as well. Some viruses though, have a larger host range. So they can infect lots of different types of animals. 
they're not that specific for humans. And these are viruses that are much harder to eradicate. Uh, NARS, I mean, we might even say they're impossible to eradicate because we would have to vaccinate not just humans, but other creatures as well in order to prevent there being any reservoirs of the virus. So flu is a classic example of a virus that I like to call, that I like to say it has a very promiscuous host range. So there's a lot of different um, organisms that it can infect and then transmit to other organisms. So flu, we will always have to vaccinate for flu. We'll always have to get our annual flu vaccine. Well, there, there is development. They are trying to develop a universal flu vaccine that we wouldn't have to get annual vaccinations, but um, we will probably have to vaccinate for it for a long time. Um, we probably won't be able to eradicate it. We might be able to prevent humans from getting it through vaccination, but we'll probably never be able to stop vaccinating humans to prevent the disease because there will always be animals who are carriers. Unlike smallpox, where there are no animal carriers, we can't get smallpox from animals. There's cowpox and there's monkeypox, but those are different diseases. So um, since we are in the middle of a global pandemic, just to highlight our current current SARS coronavirus 2, and that SARS should be capitalized, sorry, um, the structure of SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 is a, an RNA virus, a single-stranded RNA virus. It has a single long piece of single-stranded RNA, and these blue balls represent um, nucleoproteins, just proteins for the, to help stabilize the RNA, because RNA is not very stable. Um, usually on its own. It is an enveloped virus, so this is the lipid membrane surrounding it. Um, what's not shown is the capsid, but there is a capsid. These are the spike proteins that you probably hear a lot about in green. Um, and this spike protein is what is responsible for the virus being able to bind to our cells. And specifically, it binds to a receptor in cell membranes called ACE2. And ACE2 receptors are found very heavily in the epithelial cells of the lungs. So that's usually where it infects. All right. But there are other cells in the body that have ACE2 receptors, including cells in the nervous system and also white blood cells called macrophages. And one of the things about coronavirus that leads to such severe disease in some individuals is that it it can infect macrophages, which are the cells of the immune system that are sort of one of the first lines of defense that engulf, are supposed to engulf these coronaviruses and introduce them to the rest of the immune system. If they become infected, they can't do their job. So they're sort of like the early warning system. And if they are infiltrated, then your immune response is really delayed. Um, and weak towards the virus. And so it's one of the reasons why the virus can cause such serious disease. Um, uh, so these are some of the cells that, that express this ACE2 receptor that the coronavirus recognizes. And then I just wanted to show these two short animated videos because I feel like sometimes visualizing these things in 2D when they're really very dynamic um, it's harder to, to imagine. So these are just some animations that kind of show you this um, anatomy and um, absorption and penetration of the virus. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses, some of which infect humans. The coronavirus at the root of COVID-19 is the newest known member of this family. And like other coronaviruses that infect people, the new coronavirus causes respiratory disease among other symptoms. At their core, coronaviruses contain a genetic blueprint called RNA, similar to DNA. The single-stranded RNA acts as a molecular message that enables production of proteins needed for other elements of the virus. Bound to this string of RNA are nucleoproteins, proteins that help give the virus its structure and enable it to replicate. Encapsulating the RNA genome is the viral envelope which protects the virus when it is outside of a host cell. This outer envelope is made from a layer of lipids, a waxy barrier containing fat molecules. As well as protecting the precious genetic cargo, this layer anchors the different structural proteins needed by the virus to infect cells.
envelope proteins embedded in this layer aid the assembly of new virus particles once it has infected a cell. The bulbous projections seen on the outside of the coronavirus are spike proteins. This fringe of proteins gives the virus its crown or halo-like appearance under the microscope from which the latter name corona is derived. The spike proteins act as grappling hooks that allow the virus to latch onto host cells and crack them open for infection. Like all viruses, coronaviruses are unable to thrive and reproduce outside of a living host. And then this video about how they absorb and bind through the ACE receptor or the ACE2 receptor. Due to its unique features, the novel coronavirus is particularly good at infecting new cells, both in the upper respiratory tract as well as deeper down in the lungs. Here's a look at how the process takes place. The microscopic virus enters through the nose or mouth where it begins its infection of our airways. The outer spike protein of the coronavirus latches onto specific receptors on the surface of cells in our respiratory tract. In the case of COVID-19, the virus latches on to the ACE2 receptor. This binding triggers the process by which the virus fuses into human cells. The viral envelope merges with the oily membrane of our own cells, allowing the virus to release its genetic material into the inside of the healthy cell. The genetic blueprint of the virus is RNA instead of DNA, which acts as a molecular message, instructing our host cell machinery to read the template and translate it into proteins that make up new virus particles. The hijacking persists. As the human host cell continues to generate more copies of the virus, assemble these copies into viable particles, and traffic them to the outer edges of the cell for release. Each infected cell may produce and release millions of copies of the virus, which can then go on to infect other neighboring cells, as well as neighboring people, when they are expelled from the airways in droplets via coughing and sneezing. So my one problem with this video, which is disappointing because it's Scripps research, but they're just trying to simplify it for people to understand, is this part right here. So the virus, we're still inside the cell, right? But it's showing these fully formed virus particles. And as you'll see, that's not where you would see these because the envelope with these proteins actually is going to come from the virus budding off the cell surface. So this is not actually accurate. They don't look like this until they leave the cell. Um, all right, so next slide. Another one more thing about coronavirus, about its host tropism. So coronavirus, there are a lot of um, comparisons of coronavirus to flu, even though they are very different viruses. But one thing that is similar is they both are somewhat promiscuous in their host tropisms. So this, um, all of the coronaviruses that have caused outbreaks, the SARS, the original SARS, which um, caused an outbreak in China, 2002, 2003, and then MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Coronavirus in 2012, all right? These two both are thought to have evolved in bats. They are most closely related to a bat coronavirus. And then um, it's, very likely that the original SARS um, was transmitted through from bats to civet cats and then the civet cats to humans. And the intermediate host for MERS was thought to be camels. We're still trying to figure out what the intermediate host for the current coronavirus is, but just showing you all these animals, these are all different animals that can be hosts for coronaviruses. So coronaviruses, the ACE2 receptors, in these different animals are similar enough that um, coronavirus can uh, infect different animals. And we've seen cases of tigers and house cats testing positive for COVID-19, as well as I think dogs. And um, I know um, chimpanzees can be. So there's definitely a lot of animals that can um, carry coronavirus and potentially transmit it. So it's unclear you know, how many could be potential reservoirs in, um, you know, in society. So coronavirus will, even once we have a lot of people vaccinated, um, we'll have to probably maintain that because until we figure out how many animals are carrying it, um, 
yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so viruses entering cells. After they bind to the cell, they then need to enter the cell. There's two ways a virus can enter the cell. They can enter either by being swallowed in a process called endocytosis, where the cell literally just swallows them and just pinches around it and swallows it into the cell, or they can enter through direct fusion. Only enveloped viruses can directly fuse with the cell membrane because only env enveloped viruses have a membrane. So enveloped viruses can either be endocytosed or they can directly fuse to the cell. Naked viruses can only get in through this process of endocytosis. And both endocytosis and direct fusion are usually triggered by the virus binding to its receptor. That binding process triggers the cell to do endocytosis. Right? Once inside the cell, the uncoating process happens. So it, that endocytosis ends up triggering. Sometimes it triggers fusion with a lysosome. There's various ways that viruses are uncoated, um, but the capsid basically breaks open and releases the genetic material, whether it's DNA or RNA, into the cell's cytoplasm. All right? So RNA viruses and DNA viruses, um, their genetic material needs to go to different parts of the cell. So RNA viruses, once they've entered the cytoplasm and released their genetic material, they're good. They're done because ribosomes can read that RNA right away. Like you saw in that video before, I thought I started giggling a little because it looks like the ribosome's just pooping out um, all these new pieces of protein. But um, yeah, so ribosomes are found in the cytoplasm, freely in the cytoplasm. They're also on the endoplasmic reticulum here. But RNA viruses tend to replicate in the cytoplasm because there's plenty of ribosomes there. DNA viruses, however, in order to replicate DNA in a cell, all of the DNA enzymes and stuff in a cell are found in the nucleus. So DNA viruses have to get their DNA to the nucleus and they tend to replicate in the nucleus versus RNA viruses replicating in the cytoplasm. Um, retroviruses though, they, can, they are um, RNA viruses that then convert their genome into DNA and send that to the nucleus. So they kind of take place in both parts of the cell. So depending on what type of genetic material a virus has, it'll determine what part of the cell they reproduce in. This is just another diagram that I'm not gonna hold you to because it's complicated and we haven't really gotten into um, DNA and RNA and ribosomes and how transcription and translation happen. That's in chapter eight, okay? but um, just to show you, there are multiple different paths that viruses take depending on their different types of genomes. So if it's a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome, it will convert to negative sense RNA and then make more positive sense RNA. And that positive sense RNA can also be used to read um, by the ribosome to make more proteins. So there's uh, ultimately, the cell needs positive sense RNA. So you'll see in all of these that there's the last step before reproduction is converting the genome of the virus. However, it, the genome of the virus is, it gets, it's converted into positive sense RNA. We ultimately need positive sense RNA in order to make proteins. But then you also need to have a way of replicating the viral genome to package into those proteins. So just a, a number of different mechanisms that viruses use. So just also just to point out how varied viruses are. Like a virus is not um, a, how do I put it? A single thing, even a single coronavirus is not a single thing. It's a whole family of different viruses that have different spike proteins. Um, so I guess families all replicate the same. Within a family, they replicate the same, but they're, um, two different viruses can be very, very different substances. So after the virus uncoats, now it's time for assembly and release. So the assembly process is kind of what we saw on this slide here. We're seeing the assembly of more 
of the viral proteins and of um, copies of its genome so they can assemble into virions, into viral particles. So assembly is kind of cool because the way that these capsomer proteins are is they, I mean, they, they automatically form this capsid. Um, they automatically take this, that, that shape. They um, come together like almost like magnets and um, they assemble. And sometimes they assemble around nuclear material. Sometimes they're, they have a protein or an enzyme that feeds the genetic material into the capsid. Okay, so different, different viruses have different sort of assembly mechanisms or processes, but they're pretty autom automated. Um, and then they need to be released from the cell. And the two ways the virus particles can be re released is either by budding or by bursting. So budding is how enveloped viruses leave the cell and it's how they get their envelope. So inside the cell, you just see the nucleocapsid. This was my qualm with that video before, is inside the cell, we would just see the nucleocapsid. And then once it budded from the surface of the cell, then it would have its envelope and spike proteins, all right? Um, naked viruses, and this is actually showing you bacteriophages, all right, these are both types of non-enveloped viruses and they burst from the cell. So they basically fill up the cell until it ruptures. And then when it ruptures, all the virus particles spill out all at once. And then they can go infect other cells. So we can't see viruses. They're too small to see in a light microscope, but we can still sometimes tell using microscopy, whether cells are infected with a virus or not, even if we can't see the virus. And that's because viruses basically cause the cells themselves to be sick um, and cause these very uh, observable cytopathic effects. So this literally means um, diseased cell effects, cytopathic effects. So they are changes in cell appearance. Um, due to viral damage. And the two most um, common types of damage that we see are we see syncytia and we see plaques. Um, inclusion bodies, I'm not going to go over. Um, and plaques should be something you add to this list because it's in the picture here. So maybe cross out inclusion bodies and worry about plaques. So this is what a cell monolayer looks like in cell culture. So when you culture human cells, they grow um, and cover the bottom part of the plate. And when you look under the microscope, these are stained. You can see them just nicely spreading out. The dark purple spots are nuclei. And then you can kind of see some like, you know, slimy, stretchy stuff in like a faint purple. Those would be the rest of the cell body, the um, cytoplasm. So you can see that they're just kind of spread all evenly, kind of, along the bottom of this plate. Well, when you infect these cells with bacteria, I mean, sorry, with viruses, and then you wait 24 hours and you look again, now this is what you see. So you see huge, clear, white spaces where there are no cells anymore. All right, so those are like dead zones where cells have died, and we call those plaques. So a plaque is a zone where there are no cells because they've all been killed by the virus. Another thing that we see with viral infected cells, another cytopathic effect, are syncytia. So here you see a bunch of blue or purple dots tightly packed together. These are cells that have fused together. And cells that have fused together are called syncytia. Syn means together and cyto means cell. So it literally means fused together cells. Um, fun fact about syncytia and syncytial genes. So humans actually express a form uh, of a, an old virus protein that leads to syncytia formation, and it's called syncytion 1, and it's expressed specifically by placental cells. It turns out that the genes that are required for placenta formation came from a retrovirus that infected an you know a ancestor not a human but a, um, a, a an animal before and basically gave rise to mammals mammals evolved because of a virus that infected them and then stuck 
in their genome and led to the production of this protein, syncytion 1. So if we weren't infected with this virus, we would be laying eggs today. Um, so this is an example of the, like an annotated example of the endogenous, an endogenous retrovirus um, and its envelope protein um, is now our syncytion 1 that we express in the placenta. And the placenta fuses with the uterus and it fuses with the uterus the same way that virus cells induce syncytia cell fusion um, through this syncytion 1 protein. So it's kind of a neat story of mammalian evolution being due to a virus and it's one of its cytopathic effects becoming something that we adapted to reproduction. Um, it's also worth mentioning that one of the myths surrounding the coronavirus vaccine is that it will cause infertility. Um, I, one of someone who worked at Pfizer or Moderna, I can't remember which, made a claim that the coronavirus spike protein is similar to syncytion 1 and that it could induce an immune response to the placenta so that if you get vaccinated, you have an immune response to the spike, coronavirus spike, you also will have an immune response towards placenta formation and won't be able to have a baby. Um, and this has been well debunked um, by many uh, I guess pieces of evidence. So the first one is theoretical that um, if this were to happen then that means that the spike protein would need to look an awful lot like syncytion 1. It turns out the protein sequences are completely different. There's like five amino acids in common. There's like a string of five amino acids in common between the coronavirus spike protein and syncytion 1 which is not enough for them to be similar enough to uh, mount a cross-reactive immune response. The other thing is there have been millions of people infected, millions of women infected with coronavirus, and none of them have had infertility as a side effect. We have not observed this in natural infection, so it's very unlikely that we would observe this from the vaccine. So if you ever hear that myth, you know now how to debunk it. The syncytion protein that forms the placenta is like not even apples to oranges uh, with the coronavirus spike protein. They're very, very different looking. There's no way that our immune system would mistake one for the other. Alrighty, so viruses, um, another thing viruses can do is, hold on, sorry. Hey guys, I'm recording a lecture. If you could quiet down, thanks. <laughs> um, so viruses can cause persistent infections. Basically, they can they can be long lived in a cell or in a body. Um, so some cells can actually mm -hmm. silently carry virus within them, not causing disease, and then um, and not actively replicating the virus. But then the virus can be reactivated, and viral production can yeah. resume. So um, there's a couple of ways it can do this. So one way a virus can do this is by becoming a provirus. And what a provirus does is it incorporates its viral genome into the cell's genome. So it actually inserts its DNA into the, the DNA of the cell. Not all viruses can do this. Um, one type of virus that can do this is HIV. Um, and so it's one of the reasons why HIV is uncurable at this point. Well, there are some therapies that have actually been able to cure it, but they're not mainstream yet. Um, the reason that people who are HIV positive basically have to take drugs for their whole life is to keep the virus in the state and not actively replicating, but you can't get rid of it because it incorporates its DNA into the DNA of cells. Um, viruses that do this also have a tendency to cause certain types of cancer because when you mess with the DNA of a cell, you, that can lead to, to cancer. Um, some viruses can enter what's called a, like a dormant state, a chronic latent state, where they just kind of quietly exist in the cell. They don't incorporate in the DNA, but they just don't actively replicate. And then um, they can reactivate. And this is very common in herpes viruses. Herpes viruses can infect 
um, and go dormant in nerve cells and they can stay there forever. And then when your immune system is feeling down, they can um, reactivate and, and cause new infection. So a uh, graph here um, looking at the number of virus particles versus time. So in an initial infection, acute infection, you form a ton of virus particles. Your immune system fights it. Um, creates antibodies and an immune reaction and you start killing off those virus particles and it goes down but it doesn't go down to zero it just goes down very low and so what you end up having is these viruses just kind of hanging out persisting um, really low levels avoiding the immune response and then um, it can reactivate again so um, that is a uh, the difference, I guess, between a persistent infection and late infection, late infections are completely, you have no virus particles um, because it's just hiding out in your DNA and then it reactivates. A persistent infection is you have a really low level of virus particles um, that then maybe uh, due to a reduction in your immune system, it reactivates. They're able to um, reproduce again. So viruses causing cancer through incorporating in the cellular DNA is very well documented. Um, it's thought that something like 20% of cancers are actually caused by viruses. And there are some that we have a lot of evidence of and are well known to be caused by viruses. The first one is HPV, human papillomavirus. Something like 99.5% of uterine, of causes of cervical cancer are due to HPV. So it basically is a, like the only disease it causes is cancer. Um, HPV infected cells are slightly abnormal, but don't really cause any discomfort. It's the cancer is that cancer is the disease that HPV causes. So it, it literally, quite literally is a cancer virus. It caused the only disease it causes is cancer. And like 99% of the cancers um, of the cervix are caused by this virus. There's like almost no other cause of cervical cancer. Um, unlike things like lung cancer can be caused by genetics, by smoking, by different pollutants, okay? Cervical cancer, pretty much only caused by HPV. We call these types of viruses that can cause cancer, we call them oncogenic viruses. And these are viruses, all, all oncogenic viruses have the ability to incorporate their genome into the cellular DNA. So these are just three different mechanisms by which different types of viruses do this, but essentially the problem is they all have the ability to embed their genome into the cell's DNA. This is called transforming the cell. When you add DNA to a cell's genome, you are transforming it. Um, and the things that lead to cancer are an increased rate of growth by the cells. Um, alterations in genes and chromosomes can increase the rate of the growth of the cell and give them the ability to divide indefinitely and just keep dividing and dividing. That's what cancer is. Um, some other viruses, hepatitis viruses are also oncogenic. They infect the liver and cause inflammation of the liver. That's what hepatitis means. But inflammation can also trigger damage to cellular DNA. And so the chronic inflammation of the liver caused by hepatitis virus also often leads to cancer. So hep B and hep C are the big, um, are major causes of liver cancer. They're the, the number one cause of liver cancer. So those are animal viruses viruses that infect us as animals, humans. It can infect other animals too, but again, this class, we tend to focus on human pathogens. Um, and so it may seem weird that we're gonna spend time talking about bacteriophages because these are viruses that infect bacteria. We're not gonna sit here and I'm not gonna tell you about viruses that infect fish and mice and flies um, because they don't affect our health, but bacteriophages do. Um, because remember, we are mostly made of bacteria. If you count the number of human cells in your body and the number of bacterial cells in your body, there's more bacterial cells. So um, the enemy, what is it? The, the enemy 
of your friend is your enemy or the friend of your enemy is your friend, something like that, whatever. Um, some of these bacteria are our friends. And so the bacteriophages that attack them are also our enemies and vice versa. Some of these bacteria are our enemies. So the bacteriophages that infect them are our friends. So even though you might think like, oh, bacteriophages, what do they have to do with us? Because bacteria have to do with us. All right, so what is a bacteriophage? A bacteriophage, literally it means a thing that eats bacteria. It doesn't really eat them though. It's a virus that infects bacteria. They're spe they specifically infect bacterial cells. And a lot of them have this crazy complex structure that looks like a little robot alien. There's literally, this is an electron micrograph of a bacteria and all these little things on them, all these little white spots, those are bacteriophages. Um, uh, sticking to the surface of the bacteria while infecting it. Um, so another thing about bacteriophages that make them important to our health is that bacteriophages can transmit genes to uh, bacteria. They can transform bacteria and make them more pathogenic to us. Some um, bacteria that are pathogenic, like E. coli 0157, oh, 0157H7, which is a very pathogenic strain of bacteria that can make us sick. It got its um, toxin production from transformation from a, a virus, a bacteriophage. So these bacteriophages um, that look like this are called T4 bacteriophages. They just happen to be the best studied ones, but they don't all look like this, but a lot of them do. So bacteri bacteriophages um, infect cells very similarly to how animal viruses infect cells. They absorb, they bind to the surface, they penetrate. Now penetration by a bacteriophage is different and we'll see that and I'll show that in a second. And then there's of course synthesis and assembly and um, we call it synthesis and maturation here and then release. So adsorption, they bind to some receptor and phages are very specific for the types of bacteria they infect. They usually will infect only certain species of bacteria, like a certain type of bacteriophage is specific for a certain type or even strain of bacteria. Um, so the virus binds to the surface. The penetration happens literally by injecting. So the, the capsid of the bacteriophage is here, and then it has this tail. And the DNA is stored in the capsid here, but when the virus infects the cell, it literally penetrates. It has like a needle, like a syringe needle inside that, that punctures the cell membrane and injects the nucleic acid material into the cell. So it's literally like a tiny little hypodermic syringe. Um, and this looks cartoony, but it's also like an actual legitimate diagram of this protein. It just baffles me sometimes that things that you think somebody just made up, like it's a science fiction tale, like actually know that's actually how it works. So you inject the DNA, then the cell, all of the um, enzymes in the cell translate, transcribe and translate that genetic material to make more virus particles, more bacteriophage particles. They assemble into a mature virion, bacteriophage, and when they build up like enough of them inside the cell, it ultimately ruptures the bacteria and the phages are released. So some bacteriophages, just like animal viruses, can go latent and we can have these latent infections. Um, bacteriophages can do that as well, but we have a different term for it in bacteriophages, we call it um, lysogeny. So some uh, bacteriophages, we call them temperate phages. Do I have that term? Okay, temperate phages are bacteriophages that have the ability to become latent. And so this is uh, showing you the life cycle of a bacteriophage that has that ability. So there's the lytic cycle, where it's actively infecting and reproducing and bursting cells open, lysis, cell lysis. 
But if conditions aren't great, if there like aren't a lot of bacteria around to infect, then the um, the the viral DNA can become incorporated into the bacterial cell DNA. That's called lysogeny. This is the lysogenic cycle. And during lysogeny, when the bacteria replicates, it's also replicating the virus DNA with it. And so this bacteria will divide and divide and divide, and then that prophage will get reactivated. It'll pop itself out of the genomic DNA of the bacteria and start making viruses again. So these cells are just innocently replicating, having lots of babies, and then all of a sudden something triggers and they all suddenly fill with virus particles and are lysed from within. Okay, so that process of triggering the lytic cycle is called induction, and usually environmental conditions trigger induction. The, um, when the viral DNA is incorporated in the bacterial DNA, we call it a prophage, just like we call when, when a human virus, an animal virus, infects um, human DNA, we call it a provirus. So provirus or prophage represent um, a virus in a latent state. I know it's confusing because there's a lot of vocabulary here. So an animal virus, can incorporate into animal cell DNA, and we call it a provirus, and we call that a latent infection. We call it latency. But in bacteria, we have bacteriophages. So when they incorporate into bacterial DNA, it's called a prophage, and it's not called latency, it's called lysogeny. So it's like the same process, but different vocabulary. Um, when a bacteria, sometimes bacteria can permanently incorporate virus DNA and they end up just keeping it permanently and not actually, or they keep apart. So sometimes when the prophage jumps out of the genome here, um, it leaves a little bit of its DNA behind accidentally, and then that becomes permanently incorporated in the bacterial's genome, and they can start passing that on. And so when that happens, we call it lysogenic conversion. That's when bacteria pick up new genes from a virus infection that they survive. Um, and a lot of times this lysogenic conversion makes bacteria more pathogenic. It gives them the ability to express new toxins. So some examples of, of human pathogens that have become pathogens because of lysogenic conversion, Cornobacterium diphtheriae, which is the causative agent of diphtheria, which is a pretty rare disease now because it's part of the DTaP or Tdap vaccination. Um, cholera is still very prevalent in a lot of developing countries. Vibrio cholera is the bacteria and the toxin it produces causes severe diarrhea that basically dehydrates you very quickly and you die from severe dehydration. Um, Clostridium botul botulinum, which causes botulism due to a toxin that affects the nervous system. It causes muscle paralysis, um, body-wide muscle paralysis. So there are human, um, effects or these bacteriophages while they don't infect our cells. Bacteriophages cannot infect human cells. They do infect bacteria and can make them more toxic to us humans. So bacteriophages do play a role in human disease. Um, we'll also at some point talk about how, well I think it'll be in your um, video assignment, you'll see that there's also a place for bacteriophages to help cure human diseases by targeting bacteria and killing, killing pathogens. So they can be, you know, they're good guys and bad guys, depending on how you look at them. Just like all microbes kind of have this dual nature of some of them are good for us, but they, they can be bad for us, but they can also be good for us. So don't forget to think about all the ways microbes can be good for us. Okay. Um, how do we cultivate or culture viruses if they are dependent on cells? We can grow viruses in the lab. We just need to have cells to grow them with. 
So the medium, the culture medium for, for, for viruses and bacteriophages are cells, cell culture. So to grow animal viruses, we need animal cells and culture. And to grow bacteriophages, we need bacterial cells and culture. Um, this, by the way, is a picture of a plate with, with plaques, a, a bacterial culture plate showing plaques. So all of these spots you see are actually clear zones. So this opaque um, tan area of the plate is all, that's a bacterial lawn growing all over the plate. And these, these spots, these circles here represent clear zones where you can see transparently through the agar because there's no bacteria growing there um, because they've been killed by phage. So we can grow um, viruses, and so that's how we grow them in vitro in a culture dish. Um, we can also grow viruses in vivo inside living organisms like mice or eggs. Um, and we, we need to be able to grow viruses in the lab because it's how we grow viruses to make vaccines, like the flu vaccine is an inactivated flu. Um, it's how we study viruses how researchers study viruses, and um, even can sometimes be how we isolate them in order to make clinical diagnoses. So isn't, there are constantly, we're constantly involving new ways to grow and research viruses in the lab, and it's only been fairly recently in you know science history, like in the last hundred years, that we've actually been able to grow and study viruses because they're so small and so dependent on cells, we really didn't have the technology to study them like we do now. And that technology continues to improve. Um, one other type of infectious particle that we're gonna lump in here with viruses, they are not viruses. Prions or prions are their own category of infectious particle. Again, these are very recently discovered well, not that, I mean, maybe like 30 years ago. That's a guess, actually, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but certainly after viruses, we discovered prions. So prions are, they do not have any genetic material. A virus is a protein surrounding genetic material. A virus has at least those two parts, genetic material, RNA, DNA, and a protein capsid. Prions are just a single protein that misfold into a new shape and then that shape uh, or then that that uh, misfolded protein can go around and trigger other proteins to misfold as well and then these misfolded proteins a don't function properly and b have a tendency to clump together and form these clumps that end up being toxic to the cells and then the cells die and then they release these proteins that then go into other cells and start converting the proteins in those cells. So it's like a chain reaction. Um, I like to think of them as like zombie proteins because zombies are like, right, they're like dead, undead people. And then they like usually bite or like attack other live people and then they turn into zombies too. So it's like this chain reaction, right? Um, so these proteins become zombies prions and then the prion zombies can go turn other normal proteins into zombie proteins so it's like a molecular zombie attack um, and they are in nervous tissue they form in nervous tissue uh, like in the brain and their clumping causes cell death so this is an example of a, a cutting of healthy brain tissue so you can see it's all, all the pink is tissue and I think the blue is nu nuclei um, but you can see that it's there's it's a, a continuous layer of tissue, right? Whereas over here in this right picture, there's all these white bubbles. Those are air pockets. Those are pockets where there are no cells because cells have died. Um, and so it gives the appearance of a sponge. Like sponge has sponges have lots of holes in them. All right, so we say that prion disease causes spongiform encephalopathy or a disease of the brain looking spongy, having all these holes from cells that have died because of these prions. They tend to be slow, but there are some that, that are quick. They are incurable and univers universally fatal. They're terminal illnesses. Um, a very common one is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. 
this is one that can be genetic or it can be from eating um, beef that contains mad cow disease. So mad cow disease is a boat is the technical term is it bovine spongiform encephalopathy. So it's a prion disease in cows. And um, the thing about prions because their proteins and these misfolded proteins are incredibly stable. So there's no way to sterilize something that's contaminated with prions. So meat from a cow, you can um, prevent like E. coli infection by cooking your meat well and killing the E. coli bacteria, but you can't cook meat enough to get rid of prions. Same thing with surgical equipment. If someone has Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and you do brain surgery on them, you have to throw away those scalpels. You cannot sterilize them enough to make them safe for use on somebody else, or you could transmit that um, that protein to them. So again, prions are not viruses, but we're talking about them in this chapter because they are also non-living infectious particles. Um, I'm not going to get into these, but there are other, you know, subcategories of infectious agents that are not truly viruses, like satellite viruses are virus there. They're kind of like stowaway piggyback viruses. Like they can't infect a cell by themselves, but they can latch onto another virus and infect with it. Um, so viruses are a major issue for human health. They cause acute infections, things like, you know, colds, hepatitis, chicken pox, flu. These all, you know, cause an infection with symptoms that you have experience right away. Um, there's some that are really problematic and kill millions of, you know, millions of people around the globe every year. We could add coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 to this list. Um, infections with high mortality rates. SARS-CoV-2 does not have a very high mortality rate, but it has a very high infectivity rate and because, uh, and it causes a lot of disease. So it ends up causing a lot of death because it causes a lot of disease. But um, diseases like Ebola and rabies have really high mortality rates. Rabies mortality rate is actually 100%. We do have a vaccine for it that can prevent the disease, but if you don't get that vaccine in time, you will die 100% of the time. Um, Ebola has something like a 50% mortality rate. It's pretty high, a pretty deadly disease. AIDS, um, HIV is the virus that causes AIDS, and AIDS has a high mortality rate if you develop AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. But our treatments for HIV now are really pretty good, so the death rate has actually gone way, way down. Um, there are infections that, so um, things like a common cold, right, um, or even the flu, you might ha be sick for a short period of time and then fully recover. Um, but there are a lot of infections that can cause long-term disability. SARS-CoV-2 is turning out to be one of them, um, but a classic one is polio. So polio virus, actually a gastrointestinal infection, um, but then it can also infect nerve cells and kill them. So then it leads to paralysis. And it was a pretty high, a pretty high um, proportion of patients who experienced the post polio paralysis. So even after their body had gotten rid of the virus, they still had long term disability from it. And then there's more and more coming out about viruses being connected to long-term health conditions, chronic health conditions like diabetes and multiple sclerosis and various cancers, um, that chronic infections with certain types of viruses uh, could trigger these, these, type, these chronic diseases that we previously thought had nothing to do with a virus. So there's a lot of ways that viruses affect human health. And then you could even add to this list that they transform bacteria to make them more pathogenic. Um, and that they also trans have transformed us historically throughout evolution, such that 10% of our, our genes are from viruses. So they've contributed to our health and our evolution in that way. This, I guess, should say viruses and the negative effects they have on human health. 
And this is just a table from the chapter of a bunch of different viruses and the diseases they cause. You do not have to memorize these. I will not be testing on this yet later in the course when we talk about specific diseases. I will require you to know what viruses cause them. Um, but right now, this is just for your own information to check out viruses you're potentially interested in, maybe ones you've had before, ones you've heard of, um, just kind of for, for fun to look at this for information. So the last thing we'll talk about is how we treat viral infections. So antibiotics are for bacterial infections or sometimes fungal or helminth infections, okay? Antibiotics literally means anti-living things and viruses are not living things. So antibiotics are not effective at treating viruses. Sometimes doctors will give you a, an antibiotic if you have a viral infection, if they are concerned about secondary bacterial infections, or maybe they, you have both. Um, but the antibiotic will not treat the viral infection. And overprescription of antibiotics is what has majorly contributed to the rise of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so doctors have really been slapped on the wrist in the last um, decade for overprescribing um, antibiotics. So where 10 years ago, if you had a virus, your doctor might have given you an antibiotic prescription just to make you feel like they were treating you. Um, just in case it was it was bacterial, but now they're really strongly advised not to do that. So um, my husband went to the doctor a couple of years ago. He woke up, you know, sore throat, fever, coughing. He had a cold, um, but he went to the doctor. And I was like, why are you going to the doctor? He's like, oh, well, maybe you'll give me antibiotics, make me better. I'm like, it's a virus. You're not going to get anything. So he goes to the doctor. The doctor tells him the same thing. It's a virus and doesn't give him any antibiotics. And he came home all mad, like, well, I wanted antibiotics to get better. And it's like, babe, antibiotics won't make you better from a cold, from a virus. Um, and I think in the early years of this change in protocol, there was a lot of, a lot of patients felt that way, like, well, the doctor didn't do anything, um, but they can't do anything for most virus infections. We have very few drugs that can treat virus infections. Um, there are some really good ones for HIV. We've struggled to make a vaccine for HIV, but we've done a really good job of, of creating effective drugs against HIV, but those just keep it um, manageable. They don't cure it, so you have to be on those drugs for life. We also have some really good drugs for herpes viruses. Um, Acyclovir was like a huge development in the treatment of herpes viruses. And we have some treatments for flu that are like meh, um, but that's really it. Those are, oh, and we just recently got one in the, in the last, like, I don't know, five years for um, hepatitis viruses that have been um, really extending the life of people with chronic hepatitis viruses. So that's about it, though. Those are the only ones we really, that we have effective antivirals for. The reason it's hard to make antiviral drugs is because there's so few parts of the virus that are unique to the virus. Remember viruses, they hijack our cells. So um, it's very hard to find targets that are specific to the virus that don't actually also harm our cells. And some antivirals do have really yucky side effects because they aren't, ex you know, um, exclusively targeting the virus. They might be targeting parts of our cells that really just handicap the virus, but also have side effects that are unpleasant for us. So really the best treatment we have for viruses is prevention. And the best prevention that we have are vaccines. And vaccines are awesome because they prepare our immune system and um, make it so that the viruses can no longer take root in our bodies, that we have a defense mounted against them already. And we can prevent infection and even eradicate viruses from the planet through vaccination. So vaccines are the best drugs that we have developed for um, disease. And we have vaccines for bacterial disease, um, but for bacteria, we also have antibiotics. For viruses, really a lot of times the only option to 
there's no option really to treat the disease. There's only the option to prevent it through vaccination. So this is, while a little bit dated, well, this is from the CDC from 2011, okay? Um, but it's still pretty true because we're looking at data from the night, like 1900s, the early 1900s, okay? This is how many cases of measles there were um, in the early 1900s versus in modern day where we, we have a vaccine for measles, but people still sometimes don't take it. And so we get these little outbreaks here and there. Um, I think last year there were something like 300 cases or not last, maybe 2019 before coronavirus. The measles outbreaks were cropping up in a lot of places and causing a lot of problems actually. So um, the more recent numbers is probably a slightly larger bubble, but still way smaller than before we had a measles vaccine. Pertussis is whooping cough. That is a bacteria, so I won't talk about that one. Um, what are some others? Like smallpox here, okay, in the early 1900s, completely eradicated. Zero cases of smallpox since the 1970s. Um, I've never even had a smallpox vaccine. Probably none of you have had one either. Uh, my mom has one. My husband has one because he was in the military, and military you know, vets a lot of times have a smallpox scar because the vaccine actually um, causes you to develop like a pox blister at the site and then it pops and it, and it leaves a scar so that was not a fun vaccine glad we don't have to do that one anymore um polio cases also hugely down in fact there's only two countries left on planet earth where polio virus is still endemic and i think it's afghanistan and pakistan um, it used to be in Nigeria as well, but I think they might have eradicated it from there. So uh, there's definitely a worldwide a global vaccination campaign trying to eliminate polio virus. We're getting pretty close. And once we eradicate it, guess what? We don't have to get that vaccine anymore. So um, ironically, vaccination, you know, there's a lot of uh, people who are against vaccines. It's called the anti-vaccine movement um against getting vaccines but the ironic thing is if everyone got their vaccines we wouldn't have to get vaccines anymore because we could eradicate diseases and then not need those vaccines anymore so actually the best anti-vax campaign is a vaccine campaign everyone get vaccinated so we don't have to vaccinate anymore that's not true for all vaccines but for for polio it is for measles it is um we could get rid of some vaccines if we all just vaccinated it's kind of a funny you know, double-edged sword. So vaccines are incredibly effective at reducing disease and even eradicating diseases. Um, so a lot of these vaccines are given in very early childhood, partly because a lot of these diseases are childhood diseases and are most dangerous and fatal during childhood. This is just a um, schematic of the vaccine schedule in the US, which is a little bit different in different countries, by the way. So at birth, there is one vaccine that's given to newborns. That's the hepatitis B vaccine. And that's because newborns and infants who develop hepatitis B are much likely to have severe disease, develop liver cancer, have chronic liver disease, and have really serious effects versus an adult who acquires hepatitis B. And um, it's like, although hepatitis B is transmitted through blood, uh, only like 20% of infants who get hepatitis B, it, it's easy to figure out, oh, who they got it from, like an immediate family member. So it's kind of, I don't think that we really understand fully how hep B is transmitted because um, it seems to be transmitted more easily than, than we think it should be. Um, so anyway, hep B is really important for protecting infants and they get boosters at each of these appointments. I think they get three hep B shots. And then um, PCV, I think, is a pneumococcus vaccine. Hib is for a bacteria. Um, uh, what is Pediorix? I don't know. It's a combination vaccine. So it's tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, polio, and hepatitis B all in one shot. So we have a lot of these combination shots where we've combined, combined multiple shots into one. So you get fewer actual shots like needles in the arm because these used to be three different shots and now it's just one. 
Um, so we're, we're in the pharmaceutical world, they are trying to reduce the number of shots that they give. Um, so yeah, so in the first two years of life, babies are getting a lot of shots. The number of, of pathogens that they're, you know, getting these shots for is, so, it's a speck in terms of what they're being exposed to day to day in their everyday lives. Um, when you breathe in air, when babies put their fingers in their mouths, okay, they're constantly ingesting bacteria and viruses and their immune systems are being exposed all the time. So getting a vaccine with, you know, 10 different um, immunogens in it is, is a blip on the radar for their immune system. It's not overwhelming their immune system in any way. Another argument for giving vaccines young, not just to protect them young, but also um, infants have very, I don't know, I don't know what the memory is called, but they don't have much memory. So they don't remember getting their shots. They can't, they are not traumatized by the experience the way if you've ever taken a child who was like, my daughter, when she got her flu shot last year, was screaming. We had to like hold her down. Um, but then when she had to have a blood draw a couple of weeks later, she just sat there chatting with the phlebotomist. Like it, like it wasn't a big deal at all. It's something that, you know, she was just really afraid of the shot, of the, of the shot going into her arm, but not afraid of the needle going into her vein, which is, I don't get it. Um, but yeah, as we get older, we learn to fear pain and we remember it, right? So, um, babies don't. So it, it's also, I'm really glad that, um, that I didn't have to, you know, that my six month old, she screamed for a minute when they gave her the shot, it hurt. But then by a minute later, she forgot the pain and she forgot to be upset about it and she forgot it even happened and she was fine. Um, Whereas my, you know, five-year-old cried for, uh, well, actually she, after they gave her the shot and she realized it didn't hurt, she apologized. She like stopped crying and she was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I freaked out. It didn't hurt at all. But it was the fear of the anticipation and infants don't have that and toddlers don't really have that. So that's also, I think, a nice benefit of having infants vaccinated is they, they have no memory of that. So... Um, vaccines are so important for global health that in 2019, the World Health Organization came out with a list of the 10 biggest threats to global health. And these really haven't changed much, by the way. Um, and uh, anti the anti-vaccine movement is on here. Number eight, vaccine hesitancy. People not getting vaccinated is one of the top 10 threats to global health. It's a bigger threat to global health than HIV is. And I also will correct this number three here. The biggest threat, one of the, the third biggest threat to global health, they said was a global influenza pandemic. We can cross out influenza and write coronavirus. It came to fruition. Um, scientists, this was not a surprise scientists, they've been predicting a global pandemic for decades that we we were would be vulnerable to this that it was just a matter of time before a new virus entered the human population and would just spread um and we thought it would be influenza because there was a great a huge influenza pandemic about 100 years ago 2018 or sorry 1918 um and flu mutates very rapidly and we've had some really uh some influenza pandemic so honestly it was a toss-up it was going to be a toss-up between influenza and coronavirus and um I, there was a little surprise that it turned out to be coronavirus and not influenza but definitely not a surprise that there was a pandemic respiratory virus that was something the world health organization was um well aware was going to happen and but we didn't do enough to prepare for it and here we are um so I discovered this Facebook group a couple of years ago that I like to invite people to. Um, it's called Vaccine Talk. It's a forum for um, all types of people to talk about vaccines. And so there's a mixture of pro-vaccine and anti-vaccine people, but really it's a great source for facts and for information. There's a ton of, there's like 26,000 people in this group. A lot of them are researchers, are doctors, our nurses, 
um, are people who work for pharmaceutical companies. So you, it's a place where you can go to actually get input from all of those different factions of people. Um, so it's, it's really a kind of a cool place. So if you're into like those kinds of groups, go ahead and join and Facebook, just look for the group vaccine talk. Um, it's a pretty, pretty cool place. So another thing is um, the fake news uh, media um, and how we have in modern day with the internet and so many social media sites and just, you know, you can start your own website. There's all kinds of websites where you can post information that doesn't have to be vetted, um, which traditionally the Associated Press, they fact check their information. They're supposed to. The, the whole... Um, sort of philosophy behind journalism is to report the truth. And with more and more free sites to re, you know, avenues to read, anyone can report anything, we get more and more fake information out there. And um, vaccine hesitancy is largely due to fake information that is put out about vaccines and instills fear and hesitancy in people who are well-meaning and often well-educated, um, but they're flooded with this fake information. And because of this, because of the threat to public health of vaccine hesitancy, a lot of websites now are, are cracking down. Um, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, and Twitter now. Um, and then who was it? Did Twitter just ban John F, not, or Robert F, Robert Kennedy? I should know this, but Robert Kennedy Jr., some very prominent anti-vaccine person just got like very heavily censured by social media um, because of all of the false information that they're spreading about vaccines and contributing to this global health problem of vaccine hesitancy. So um, if you are vaccine hesitant or you know people who are vaccine hesitant, um, I part am particularly passionate about helping to educate people about vaccines and vaccine safety. So please feel free to re to refer anyone you know to me or check out this, um, this group in Facebook. It's a great resource for uh, discussion and also for factual evidence-based information um, regarding vaccines. So we will talk more about vaccines in a later chapter, about how they're designed, and I'll get into that more. Um, but I'm just previewing it here, priming you for it. All right, that was a long one. I'll stop now. Bye!